recording and we are recording and I'm going to let everybody in. There's still people joining us. Yes, hello, good afternoon. I, can, I need a different picture. What's going on here? Got some more coming in, but whenever you're ready, boss. All right, I see they're still rolling in. Well, it's, uh, it's 12.01, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Boca Chambers uh, special presentation today um, on the Boca Raton Center for the Arts and Innovation uh, Project uh, in Meisner Park. My name is Troy McClellan. I am your Chamber President and CEO, and I'll be leading us through the next hour or so um, with our special guest and talking about this uh, very special project. Uh, as you continue to, to roll in on the Zoom. I welcome everybody for this. I'm glad you're joining us. This is a, a special project in our community, uh, and we've got some really exciting updates uh, on this project that's been going on for uh, several years already. So uh, before we jump right into it, I'm going to turn it back over to Chastity, and she's going to give you some of the ground rules of how we're going to operate the Zoom in the next hour and, and how you can ask questions. Um, if we have time at the end of the presentation. So, Chastity. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are doing this in a meeting format, so your faces are being seen. Please note that we are recording this presentation, so if you don't want your face to be recorded, you can shut your video off while listening to the presentation. You can ask questions by hovering over your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen, and you see that little chat box. You can open up that chat box and you can just put your questions in there. And if you want to be anonymous, you can either direct them to Troy so that nobody else can see the question or you can just leave it in the open discussion. If you miss any part of this presentation or you want to share this presentation with your friends and colleagues, please be sure to see the recording on our YouTube channel later on this afternoon. So enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Chastity. And I should probably ask if you have not already subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, please go there and do so. And you can be up to speed on all the great content uh, that we're providing you and, and the entire business community during this time. So um, I'm going to jump right in and introduce our guest speaker, Andrea Virgin. Um, she's got a really long and distinguished bio. So I had to shorten it uh, a little bit, but I, I want to highlight um, some key points. Um, the first sentence of her bio is, is accurate and it says Andrea Virgin is a rare breed. Um, and here's why, because she was a professional ballerina or is, or maybe once a professional ballerina, always a professional ballerina. Right. I don't think she dances quite as much as she used to. Um, but then she turned land development engineer. So two sort of very different uh, professions. But after nearly 20 years in working in both commercial real estate and the performing arts, she decided to combine both her passions uh, with love of her community in order to fill a gap in Boca Raton that she's known has existed for decades. Andrea was raised right here in Boca Raton. She is a Boca Ratonian native. In addition to her academic education, she trained at Boca Ballet Theater and Herod Conservatory to become a professional ballerina ultimately dancing with both the Houston Ballet and Ballet Florida. Amidst her full schedule, Andrea has also made a point of enrolling full-time as a college student for her second career as a civil engineer. Upon graduation from FAU Goals and Cornell University, she swapped her point, pointy shoes for a hard hat and began working for large design companies, using her creative side to design projects that would change the landscape of cities in the South Florida region. In January of 2018, Andrea started her own firm, Virgin Design, right here, of course, in Boca Raton. Simultaneously, she joined the board of directors at Boca Ballet Theater, where the concept of envisioning and ultimately developing a performing arts center in Boca Raton was born. Since then, the combination of her past experience 
relationships with arts and culture organizations, and connections in the world of commercial real estate have taken this vision to a point where over $1 million in both seed money and in-kind services have been donated. Major stakeholders have gathered, some of the world's best consultants have been engaged and promising discussions for philanthropic support have begun to materialize. Andrea currently sits as president of the nonprofit organization behind the vision and looks forward to bringing Boca Raton the world-class performance and exhibition venues that mirror our world-class city. So with that um, introduction um, of, uh, of Andrea's bio, uh, I would like to add, as I mentioned, and you read by the bio, this project has been going on for some time. This is a pre-COVID project. Uh, Andrea has uh, uh, spent just a lot of, you know, sort of blood, sweat, and tears, as you say, uh, into creating um, what we believe will be a one-of-a-kind um, arts and innovation center here uh, in our community, which is obviously important to the community at large. Uh, but when we think from a chamber perspective, uh, how important arts and culture is, it'll be great for uh, economic development and furthering that down the road. So. Um, I know she's got a great presentation, a lot of exciting slides, a lot of good news to share. And I know that we're certainly looking for, for good news, especially uh, in our community. So Andrea, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Troy, for that introduction. And thank you so much for having me on today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I wanna take a moment just to uh, pause and acknowledge that these are difficult times. Um, we're all in this together, as the Chamber has said. Um, and as much as we're doing everything that we can every day to balance work, family, and the challenges that come with those two, um, and also the missing of interacting with our community, times like these offer us an opportunity to pause and to reflect and to plan, shift, and adapt while looking ahead to a brighter future, as Troy said. In addition to thinking about emerging from this, we should also be thinking about how we can reinvent ourselves as a city because the biggest tragedy of all coming out of this would be to do everything as we had done before. I hope this presentation provides you with a bit of a sense of hope to this business community, since we're all you know, in this together in quite a difficult time, um, instead of just thinking about coming out of this on the other side unchanged. So I hope that's kind of the theme behind this, this whole presentation. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the who, what, where, when, why of this project in a little bit of a different order than than that exactly. We're gonna start off with who's behind it, why we started it, um, a little bit of context because there's some people I'm sure on this call who've never seen this before. So I just wanna give a little bit of a history to it. Um, where it's being proposed, what is being proposed, which by the way, these are some of the most beautiful renderings and nobody else besides Chastity who, who saw these briefly yesterday have seen. So you will be one of the first to see them how this project uh, will be done, how much it costs, and how much of an effect on the economy it'll have, and when it's proposed to happen if we are given the green light to move forward. So you heard a little bit about me and my very unique background, um, but we, uh, it's not just me behind this effort. We have an expanded board of directors. Um, it's about eight people uh, made up of many different backgrounds who are here to basically uh, help see this, this process forward. I'm gonna hide the speakers here real quick because otherwise I can't really see what, what, what I'm seeing here on the screen. I just want to read you our mission statement because it is what drives us every day um, and what we're doing for this project. So it is to explore the feasibility of creating a comprehensive, economically vibrant, innovative, and sustainable cultural destination in Boca Raton that will enhance the arts and culture infrastructure in the city, benefit our residents, patrons, visitors, organizations, and civic and business communities, and be a landmark along the Gold Coast for future generations of audiences, artists, businesses, technologies, and institutions. Every single word in this mission statement has been put in there for a reason. And as you see this presentation um, today, you'll see how each one of those words really uh, resonates in this world-class venue that we're proposing. Uh, in addition to our formal fiscal board, we have an advisory board, which is made up of the local stakeholders here in this community. This project began with the intent to provide infrastructure that mirrored the cultural institutions of our city, but has expanded to not only meet those needs, but meet the needs of other stakeholders in this city, as i.e. the business community that we, um, we have watching this presentation today, the hospitality sector, and we have representatives of all of those different facets here on our advisory board. 
You can see their logos off to the left. They meet quarterly and um, have two people on their board that have been self-appointed to sit on the fiscal board so that we can make sure that once the center is up and running that the local stakeholders are not forgotten, which is often what happens in major venues across the country. In order to get this whole thing done, it can't just be a bunch of volunteer hours. Uh, there is a lot of money that has been uh, devoted to this project, as Troy mentioned, over a million dollars, both of cash and in-kind services from our world-renowned consultants. But in terms of cash, that is absolutely necessary because nobody works for free. We have raised um, over three quarters of a million dollars. Um, and thanks to the people that you see there on the screen, they are helping set the foundation of this project and we are very grateful for each and every one of them. In terms of the consultants that that money is going towards, um, let me just kind of briefly describe to you each one of them. There is the DeVos Institute of Arts Management. Uh, we met them at the pretty much the first end of the first year of this project and they have been absolutely paramount in the success of the last two years worth of work. They are the number one uh, group in the world that puts together infrastructure like this. They've worked in 80 different countries with thousands of organizations building the centers of the future. And we are very grateful to have them and their leadership walking us and the board through this process. In addition, talking about world-class consultants, IBI Group, our architects, they are the sixth largest in the world. You'll see through today's renderings why we selected them. They are absolutely phenomenal and we're grateful to have them on board. Gunster, one of our own board members here for the chamber, uh, Mike Marshall representing us for land use um, and other legal services. OGK Creative for the marketing that you see here in this beautiful presentation. Door-to-door -door strategies along with uh, political consulting LLC um, for advertising and public relations. Some surveying, mapping, traffic, parking, economic impact studies, commercial appraisals. This type of project requires a tremendous team and, and we're grateful to each and every single one of these uh, consultants that you see here. In terms of the amount of money spent, I, I put this up here to show that not, we didn't just put together some, um, some plans and some, and some uh, you know, initial work, we have spent a tremendous amount of money and actually in, due to the in-kind services this is really actually something closer to about a million dollars worth of effort. And we hope that you're impressed by what you see today. So why we did this, um, I think we can all agree things that make a city great include, of course, this robust business community, um, education, transportation, all of these things that you see here. And Boca Raton does a lot of them really wonderfully. It's why we live here. It's why we work here. It's why we've moved here, some of us. Um, and it's why some of us, like myself, have stayed here. But what we are missing in terms of this complete picture of a world-class city, and when you think about any world-class city, I think you could all agree that there is arts and culture infrastructure that really completes the picture. And that is the one missing piece that we have here in this city and that we're looking to fill that gap, as Troy had mentioned. In terms of filling that gap, you think about the Tri-County area, the Gold Coast, it's very similar to actually the Bright Line map that, that was put up there, right? You've got West Palm Beach, Boca Raton, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, it's the, the major cities along the Gold Coast. You have the Kravis Center in West Palm Beach. You skip Boca 50 miles later, you get to the Broward Center, and then you have the Arch Center in Miami. Those are the three biggest venues that we have here along the Gold Coast. Not only are, do we not have proper infrastructure in this city to, um, to bring and attract activity here to Boca Raton, but our residents are leaving Boca Raton and taking their money with them to the north or to the south. The other venues are fine, they're wonderful, um, and they have very much a big purpose in our Gold Coast, but we live in a gap and we can do more in this county and in the city in particular by filling the gap. In addition, uh, money has been spent on studies which, which support the need. This is a needs assessment that was done back in 2017. Um, I think you can see in that second to last highlighted point, it fits the character of the community of Boca Raton to create and maintain the highest quality of community assets, both as a service to its residents as well as to its present and future corporate citizens. This is why we are doing this, is, is exactly that statement. We need infrastructure that mirrors the world-class city that we live in. I, I 
I, we, we had a wonderful presentation not too long ago, just before COVID hit, uh, where we talked about the impact of arts and culture on an economy. And you can see here by these impressive statistics, $663 million of economic activity from arts and culture activity in our county alone. The rest of the information here you can see here is quite impactful. And so you can understand that why we have this gap, we can see how much is really being missed out here in Boca Raton. And on top of all of that, the biggest why is that our residents want it. Back in 2017, when the city was considering a government master plan, they were considering certain other amenities that they surveyed the residents to see if they wanted. And one of those was a performing arts center. Of the people that responded to the survey, which was around 800 people, 65% of them said yes, they want a performing arts center. Now that was being considered there in the government master plan and those that said no, some of them was, was it was simply because they didn't want that in that location. So uh, the majority of the residents wanted it then and since then we put out a survey on our website and communicated that through social media and we had a 99% response of yes, they were favorable with having this project come to Boca Raton, have it come to the Meisner Park area and of those 99% of people, 80% of, of them said that they would use it frequently, which was at least once a week. So where is this project being located? I, I, we presented this project back in 2018. As Troy mentioned, we've been at this for three years. Originally, we had proposed, and if you can see my cursor, um, we had proposed an arts district, which was this uh, proposal for infrastructure, along with other complementary uses like retail and hospitality. Um, here in this 26 acre parcel just um, along Spanish River and east of Military Trail and west of 95. Since then, uh, once we presented that to the city council, it, it was discussed that we should look around town and make sure we pick exactly the right spot. These are some of the things that we looked for and upon considering all of those factors, we landed upon Meisner Park, which is an exciting location for many reasons that I'll highlight here in a moment. First and foremost, it builds upon the original concept. This was a rendering that was created almost three decades ago. And as you can see to the left, you've got the Museum of Art, the amphitheater that was built here in the center. And this was an enclosed venue concert hall that was envisioned three decades ago. Um, I think we can all um, say how, how important this is as a promise to our residents. When Meisner Park was first envisioned, it was promised to our residents who through bonds and through referenda that it was promised that Meisner Park would be a cultural park. It would be with a focus on culture. And this, this proposal of coming in and completing this chapter is a really great way of fulfilling that promise to the, the residents of Boca Raton. Here you can see an aerial image of the amphitheater that's been built and this east vacant parcel that has sat here vacant for decades. So this would be completing that original chapter. The other benefits include the fact that we uh, have a tremendous asset in Meisner Park with its restaurants and its retail, um, its vicinity to the hospitality market, and now with its upcoming Brightline station coming right across the street. With, with a project like this, we can greatly benefit all of those existing uses and add foot traffic that is so desperately needed in Boca Raton. And in terms of ridership for Brightline, right now we're, we're living in a market of, of COVID where we, um, we, we may not have as much ridership as we had originally projected with people working from home remotely, at least for now for the foreseeable future. So what can we do to support that very important project coming to Boca Raton and adding people a reason to stop in Boca Raton for, for itself as a destination? Meisner Park also needs its next chapter. I think many of us have been here long enough to see each chapter of Meisner Park evolve from its inception. Um, right now, we are approaching an end to a chapter um, through, through not only because COVID has hit, but, but it is time for an, a, re, a reinvention. Here you can see the amphitheater, which is depreciating and in need of major capital to bring it back up. You have the vacant parcel off to the east of that. You have the Meisner Park Cultural Center, which is in need of, of filling, right? It's got a lot of vacant space. And then now recently in the last few weeks, the Lord and Taylor has closed and is gonna be sitting there vacant. With the Brightline Station being in that immediate vicinity, this, these two anchors of Meisner Park, which are meant to drive foot traffic into Meisner, really we need to be thinking about what we can do to give Meisner Park its next chapter. 
And last but not least, why we are doing this, uh, we, we would not be spending our time uh, focusing in on this parcel without conceptual support from the city since they do own it. Uh, thankfully, last year after a presentation to the city council, we had a unanimous vote of approval of conceptual support that gave our donors and our board the comfort of spending a half a million dollars towards the planning efforts that you're gonna see here in this presentation. Now, what we're presenting, this is very, very exciting and I'm thrilled to present to you what this proposal is. As I mentioned in the beginning, this was initially thought of as providing beautiful infrastructure to support the local organizations. And at its core, it still does that. But if you look at the statistics of our city and those that attend cultural events, now I'm a dancer, like will be forever, a supporter of the arts, but we are, also realists when we come to planning a project of this scale. The National Endowment of the Arts does a study every year talking about the percentage of people that attend certain cultural events. And you can see that percentage here allocated to the roughly 100,000 residents that we have here in Boca Raton. You can see that the attendance projections, if you were just solely to focus on a Boca Raton market, is not enough to sustain a theater of this scale. So when you expand this relevance of a center, even just 30 miles, you can see with the attendance projections, even if it's just strictly the performing arts, what that does for the attendance projections. So at the end of the day, we need to not just build a theater for these local organizations. Yes, at its core, it will do that. They are part of our advisory board and we will be doing all we can to, to provide them with the infrastructure that they need, but we must make it relevant for as many uses, for as many days, for as many weeks and nights and, and every year uh, as possible to make it successful. This is an example of one venue. In today's day and age for performing facilities, for venues, for infrastructure, they're called multi-form theaters. Back in the 90s, there was a major boom of building of theaters and they are what you know of them today. Very single purpose, single use, fixed seating, fixed stage, nothing moves, and it's fine for the traditional performing arts, but it is not enough anymore. We are looking ahead to the future, building theaters of the future, and they're very much representative of what you see on the left-hand side. These four pictures and this fifth picture represent all one space. This is one single space that can adapt to accommodate a probably 15 different configurations, allowing a tremendous amount of usage day, night, weekday, or weekend. You can see here there's a banquet, there's obviously the ability to do traditional proscenium setup. You can have major technology infused in here to make exciting exhibitions, or you can make it more intimate by bringing the seats in if it was a much smaller presentation. The use of technology and versatility is where theater design is going, and that is what we're so thrilled to be presenting to you here today. Multi-form theaters, there's only about a handful of theaters that can do this in the world today. Um, one of them is the Brown Theater, Brown University Theater here in the United States. Just recently funded was the Ron Perlman Theater at Ground Zero. Those renderings have just been released. We would be one of the first locations in the country, let alone in the world, that would be having this type of facility here right in our own home in Boca Raton. Technology and versatility is a major aspect of our project. Uh, through the use of digital projection, uh, LED screens, other broadcast equipment, we can be hugely adaptable in presenting not just your traditional performing arts, but anything that would require a space that is versatile. Business convenings, product launches, uh, political debates, fashion shows, think tank conferences, anything and everything can be, can be presented here. And through the use of technology, we can simulcast onto different spaces so that we can consider things like COVID in the future. Technology and versatility also allows us to present exhibitions and also uh, allowing things like MIT Media Lab to come and present here in Boca Raton. Um, for example, off to the left, this is a space that allows the use of digital projection to make you feel like you're in a room uh, of rain. You are completely dry, yet you feel through the senses that you have in that room of being wet. Things like this could come to Boca Raton um, through the use of these different spaces that I'll be presenting here in a moment. Additionally, things like MIT Media Lab, which comes and does a, a residency in different parts of the country, could come and, and showcase their research and development here in Boca Raton. So as, as I said before, this is not a center of the last 100 years. This is a center for the next 100 years. So this is the site master plan. 
Um, off to the left in number one, you can see the Museum of Art. Number two is the existing amphitheater with a slight adjustment that you're gonna see presented here in a moment. We have extended the stage out to the south, allowing for an indoor venue to, to be made possible through the dropping of the front. You could have an indoor venue going on or event going on while having the open lawn available to the public or a film screening could be presented through the new, the new wall that we're proposing on the front. This is the new venue. This is a traditional proscenium seating arrangement, but again, it's highly flexible. You could have a custom made fashion show stage uh, come down the center and all the seating move to the side. All the seats can suppress. You can have an open floor concept for, for example, Tesla presenting their new car could come in through the, the freight elevators, bring out their cars and you could have a major product launch happen here. So tremendous business and commerce activity in addition to its traditional setting as well. A new parking garage to support the new uses, even though this was contemplated 30 years ago, the restaurants in Meissner Park that have been added over the years have eaten into that excess parking and we all know that parking can be a challenge. So a new parking garage has been proposed here on the rear with access along Meissner Boulevard. And then a new, um, another extension here for a 99 seat venue that is also highly flexible. Could be a rehearsal studio, could be a lecture hall, could be a conference room. Uh, many different arrangements could be happening here as well. Some shared workspace, um, some office space for the organization that would be running it, some studio space just above it, some food and beverage offerings, outdoor seating for, for that food and beverage offering, an extension to the amphitheater plaza, a new vehicular drop off for share ride and, um, and just convenience during the day. And as you can see here in this dash line, this is an ex a canopy that extends over the entire public open realm that allows this place to be hugely uh, usable all year long. And that's the first uh, point that we're gonna be talking about when we talk about the improvements to the amphitheater. So first and foremost, the Meisner Park Amphitheater has a tremendous place in our community and in our downtown and here in, Bo in Meisner Park, but it is only used about 50 to 60 nights a year highly underutilized and in need of a capital infusion. Um, it has uh, served us very well over the years, but as any asset built three decades ago, it is time for, for an upgrade. And this project wants to infuse capital in order to do that. First and foremost, we want to create a covered, uh, we wanted to create a, a better amenity experience for anyone who would go and visit it. So these are precedent images that talk about what those um, aspects might be. This is a water sheet, which would allow families and um, our community to enjoy during the day um, or on the weekends, but that water with a push of a button can recede underground enabling outdoor seating for a concert at the amphitheater. Mass yoga would be benefiting from a covered canopy, allowing it to be a lot more hospitable for events like that. A lot more outdoor seating, a lot more benches, just making this a very hospitable area to enjoy day in and day out, whether you're there for an event or not. First, first thing we wanted to look at, as I mentioned before, was a canopy, and not just any canopy. This canopy is first and foremost very iconic, um, in its look, but it is incredibly functional. The glazing on this canopy is one of those similar to sunglasses that you've seen or these, these glasses you've seen that shade during the day, but then at night if you wanted to look up at the stars, you still can do that when the glazing recedes due to the sunlight being gone. In addition, you can kind of see these louvers. Um, it allows uh, the rain to be prevented to enter in, so you remain dry, which is huge for events but it also allows breeze to enter in and the heat that rises to leave, making this what we call in architecture a third space. It's not indoors, it's not outdoors, but it's somewhere in the middle where without the use of HVAC systems, you can have a very enjoyable experience in being outside. And as we all know, right now sitting in August here in Boca Raton, it can be pretty oppressively hot outside. So we want a public amenity that people can go and enjoy and we wanna make it as enjoyable as possible. In addition, uh, as I talked about, the enclosed venue, or sorry, the, the amphitheater is being designed also to accommodate an enclosed venue, allowing this existing piece of infrastructure to be used and maximized in its greatest potential. So by extending out the stage, you can have seating indoors, or you can open up the amphitheater door and have a typical amphitheater experience. This is an example of what could happen indoors of the amphitheater stage, which when not used outside is vacant. Right here is that screen that you saw going up. 
This is what we would experience on the inside. The, the door would be shut. You could have these digital projection experiences within the stage or quite frankly, any of the venues that we're proposing here today. But this is to show you what could happen on the stage of the amphitheater, hugely exciting. In addition, public amenities um, for an experience outside. Uh, we all know that um, when you go to an event, there, there is a lacking of, of certain infrastructure and we wanna fix that. So first and foremost, for ticketed events, there will be an improved will call um, and box office experience. The restrooms that are currently located on the side of the amphitheater will be moved forward to allow for easier access for our patrons who otherwise would have to kind of walk all the way around uh, to the other side of the amphitheater. There will be better food and beverage offerings, a drop off um, for vehicles. It would be really helpful to have the parking really adjacent to that so that we're not fighting for parking within the garages of Meister Park. So there's that, that new parking garage proposed as well. In addition, it, it, it's just going to um, allow for even VIP experiences to, to happen. So the colonies that are there today, they do serve a purpose in terms of VIP experiences. We are proposing that back uh, in this vision, just something that is being designed that will fit the architecture of the new venue to the east. So this is a picture, a, a rendering um, that is giving you kind of that look and feel of what you would experience being on the amphitheater plaza today, looking ahead towards the new venue. This is another view of that, hugely exciting. Now moving on to the new venue, you can see it here in this rendering. Um, there is a lot to be excited about here and I just wanna talk a little bit about the architecture that has been designed here. What you can get senses of, notes of is, um, you know, Boca is beautiful. And, and as much as this is iconic architecture and it is different than the Meisner-esque architecture that we have, Addison Meisner was hugely innovative in architecture of his time. He made Boca the look that and feel that it is today. And as much as we wanna celebrate the pillars of the past, we are approaching our 100th year anniversary as a city and what are we doing to be innovative, to continue to be world-class and looking ahead. And when you think about infrastructure like this, People want iconic, experiential um, architecture that is Instagrammable. I hate to use that word, but that's where everyone is going. They want to be in spaces um, where they can document and experience the, just by being at a new venue. So that's some notes of that is almost like a, a jewelry box, almost like a perfume bottle, while still having these kind of sustainable notes throughout. You can see here an iconic staircase that is functional, getting you to the different levels of the center, while also just being a beautiful beacon, just like the vessel in New York City is. There's an interior staircase you'll see here in a moment. This is the indoor portion of the venue covering the house of the proscenium theater inside. There's a terrace level here that would allow for some outdoor activities, some pop-up shops, some festivals. In here is rehearsal studio shared workspace. There's the 99 seat proscenium uh, uh, flexible space over here, food and beverage offerings here, and office space over in this corner. In terms of the new venue, we're keeping it right sized. We are absolutely not here to compete with the adjacent venues to the north and south via the Kravis and the Broward Center, which are wonderful venues, and are sized to accommodate Broadway touring shows and other major, major exhibitions. We are Boca Raton and we are more boutique than those. Uh, we are a smaller community than those major uh, municipalities. So we have to build this right size, but that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't be capable of housing major, major events. Um, through the use of, of technology and simulcast and, and broadcasting abilities, we are able to accommodate in all these different spaces up to 6,000 patrons, either doing individual activities and events and programs, or they could be through the use of technology, all watching and experiencing the exact same thing being shown in the main theater. This is an explanation of all of the different spaces. So you have your amphitheater, um, plaza, Hollywood Bowl style setting that can accommodate now 3,500 people, even with the changes in amenities. A black box that's up to 450 people within the amphitheater stage itself if it were to be shut. A new state-of-the-art concert and performance hall, that main hall that you saw there that accommodates 1,100. A rooftop terrace that you saw there in that rendering that can accommodate a seating of 200 people. The jewel box, smaller performance space, 99 seats in a traditional setting, all, or all those seats can suppress into the wall for an open floor concept. And last but not least, an open air lobby elevated above ground that allows for yet another performance and convening space. Altogether, the sum of the parts of this center will be able to accommodate up to 6,000 people. 
I'm going to share with you some of the images that I just described. This is that open air, I'm uh, sorry, this is the lobby of the main center. You can get a sense here for, for really how this mirrors our beautiful city and how we really don't have anything like this um, here in Boca Raton. This is the main hall. And what's really exciting is we can show you a suppressed version of all those seats. Um, through the use of mechanical technology, with the push of a button, uh, we can suppress all of these seats down into the floor and have this open floor concept. So you can see here, this is a traditional setup or with the push of a button, we can suppress all those seats to the ground. There will also be the ability to move the seats to the side, to the back, to accommodate a multiple amount of configurations that really highly uh, provide flexibility in the center. This is that 99 seat flexible space. Again, all these seats can suppress underground and move towards the back. It has a view of the studios above it, which is inspiring just to look at. And if you didn't want it, there would be glazing to allow that to be shut off from the room for, for obvious purposes. At the end of the day, we want this to be exciting inside, but we also want it to be hugely exciting from the outside. This is meant to be an open air public amenity for all. And again, as I mentioned, through the use of this canopy, through the use of these different public spaces, you don't lose that public realm. You don't lose that public space just through you know, throwing a big building on a, a vacant parcel. We wanna make this hospitable and enjoyable from anyone from families to athletes, community groups, tourists, students, event planners, city agencies, and residents. This is a place truly for all. Here's a view from the terrace level, looking at that iconic staircase off to the museum over here, the new plaza, different walkabil walkability. Um, in speaking with, with folks like Baptist, thinking about community health partnerships in the future, allowing a one mile track to go around here, allowing Saturday morning yogas to, to take place. So in as much as this is a performing arts center at its core, it does, as you can see, so much more. In terms of traffic and parking, which is a question that everybody asks, of course, we did a, a traffic and parking analysis for this. Um, in terms of the new parking spaces, which again, although this was master planned, um, it's in great need of its own parking. So looking at the different venues um, that we've added in here, additional support space, retail, office, restaurant, in addition to the new venues, um, after doing the calculations, it's about 300 parking spaces. In that parking garage, we have about five decks proposed right now, which is what we need. But if the city of Boca Raton or if Brookfield wanted or desired more parking, we can go up another five decks and double that. Um, of course, we're only proposing what we need, but should that partnership be desired, we could do that as well. And in terms of traffic, thankfully, because this was master planned through the DRI, um, the intersections that would be affected by this project are under capacity, knowing that this would in the future come online one day. Um, and the only uh, infrastructure that we would require is a right turn lane into the parking garage along Meisner Boulevard. And last but not least, uh, we had other things we wanted to propose on the north end in terms of office space and rehearsal studios that uh, would support the uh, organization that would be running it, in addition to those that would be renting it. Um, and you don't have to build everything from the ground up. There is existing infrastructure there that we wanted to utilize. So in working with the board at the Miser Park Cultural Center, um, thanks to Peg Anderson, we have discussed the possibility of building instead of from the ground up um, and just fitting out in the vacant space that they have there in that building, two large rehearsal studios and about 20 to 30 workspaces. So it's at the end of the day, trying to make the best use of everything that we have and trying to re-anchor both ends of Meisner Park as it was originally intended. Now, how much is this going to cost, which is another great question we get, um, and it's an important one. Uh, thanks to Moss Construction and Suffolk Construction, we were given um, the ability to accurately price this project with real world numbers here in South Florida. And coincidentally enough, in giving the materials to both of these contractors, they came back within 5% of each other, giving us a really good idea that this was an accurate pricing. And coincidentally, it was within 5% of our original estimates, which is, is, is great to know as well. So these are the costs. So the new center is roughly $65 million, uh, which $65 million is, is really, you'll see in a moment, quite a good price for, it's a good bang for your buck because you get quite a bit through it. The amphitheater and plaza improvements, this is around $15 million. Parking and soft costs associated with that is around two, $12 million. FF&E describes all of the technical fit out uh, through the, the, the use of technology that is a high ticket price item and we're budgeting that at $5 million. 
remote office space, which we would need um, during the planning, fundraising, and construction phases, around a million dollars, and a contingency fee of 5%, along with capital campaign expenses, you have to spend money to raise money, is around a $110 million project. If you look at this as a comparison to adjacent facilities, um, you can see how you're really getting a lot for your money uh, here in Boca Raton if we were to propose this. The square footage uh, that you saw in the presentation is around 85,000 square feet for a ticket price of $110 million in capital. As you can see with some of the adjacent facilities that are much larger, they also you know, cost, cost quite a bit more money. So as again, this is talking about scalability for Boca. Boca is trying to be, we wanna be right fit for the market. So Kravis Center, you can see here is just a little over 400,000 square feet for a capital cost of 330 million. Um, the, the Arsh Center, Broward, Phillips, you can all see that these are much larger facilities, larger capital costs, um, larger annual uh, operating expenses. Um, but you can see that our number of theaters that we're providing through the flexible spaces that we, you saw just before um, are still pretty close to those other venues, but yet at a price and a square footage that is really reasonable. And then in addition to the capital costs, we want to do this right. We want to uh, raise money in advance of anything coming up in the future. So in addition to raising the capital to build the structure, we want to raise 5% uh, 5 of that cost for a maintenance reserve so that in the case of um, anything happening to the building, we have money to fix it instead of waiting for insurances or raising money to do those capital improvements. Um, in addition, an endowment of almost $14 million we want to raise up front so that in the case of a downturned market, in the case of a pandemic like we're dealing with right now, we have money uh, set aside that really helps us weather the storm. And then, of course, the 2% to raise all of that extra money with a final ticket price of $126 million. Now, how this affects our local economy is one of the biggest reasons why I'm really excited to give this presentation to you today. Sorrel Phillips did our economic impact study, highly recommended by the Cultural Council and uh, Discover the Palm Beaches. We have, um, in the first five years of, of activity through the operations of the center, have $1.3 billion in economic activity, 12,000 jobs and over 500 million in incomes towards, towards our local um, residents. In addition, in terms of projected tourists and retained resident spending, remember all of our residents are leaving and people are not coming to Boca for this type of activity. So just through that activity alone, $900 million of economic activity in the first five years. The hospitality sector, which is why uh, we've been you know, hugely sponsored by the Boca Resort, over 2 million room nights in the first five years, $440 million in spending on lodging in that first five years. And after the first five years, it'll be about a half a million room nights every single year going forward. In terms of the local uh, tax benefits for the, the local um, agencies, you can see so the city of Boca Raton, $10.5 million in the first five years paid to the city through taxes. The county, 14.2, which is not inclusive of the bed tax, um, 33 million to the state of Florida, 98 million to the federal government. In terms of government uh, impact through construction, you can see there are 1,500 jobs and 200, over $200 million in economic benefits in the two years it would take to construct this. Now when, everyone after seeing some of these renderings are probably wondering when this is gonna happen. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of where we are right now, we had done a, a big stakeholder survey back in the fall. We implemented all that and did what you saw here in this presentation, master planning, conceptual renderings, performas, business plan, economic impact study, um, commercial appraisal, business model. I mean, you name it, we've done it. You've seen a, a good majority of that here in this presentation. We had in this summer, we had some advanced discussions talking about financial and management structuring for the financial aspect of this project. We are sitting here in late summer, early fall, doing public, public and stakeholder review. And later this fall, we'll be presenting a formal full proposal to the city uh, of Boca Raton um, through one of their workshops here in late fall. And in terms of the project timeline going forward, uh, it takes about three years to fundraise for a project like this, COVID considered, two to three years. We hope even sooner. Planning and design would be simultaneous to that. You'd have administrative space built out for proof of concept and also a space for us to operate out of. Uh, the amphitheater would get the first wave of capital. Then the new center would be built over the course of two years with fit out taking um, the course a better part of a year and a grand opening projected in 2025 if we were given the green light in um, 
here in the fall. And it just so happens to be that 2025 represents our 100th year anniversary and how exciting it could be if uh, we could celebrate the last 100 years while looking ahead to the next 100 with the next century piece of infrastructure. So that's my presentation. I am happy to open this up to questions, which I'm sure there may be quite a few. And I will open up this chat box. And I think that Sarah is going to moderate that, right? Oh. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to moderate it, Andrea. But first, let me um, remind everybody, if you have questions right now, put it in the chat box. Uh, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we have 15 minutes left for the presentation, but first let me just say thank you. That was just a wicked awesome presentation. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've been talking with you about this project for years, and so to see it at its point today uh, is uh, nothing short of amazing. So thank you for that. It is clear that you have put, and your team have put, uh, amazing amount of effort and work uh, into where this is today. Um, we know that this project um, will, will be built and come to fruition well beyond COVID. Uh, we'll be back um, to sort of our normal lifestyles, um, maybe with some modifications. But uh, the one thing we are going to crave and need um, is a venue like this where we can come together um, and gather. So um, this is just great news for all of us to hear. Uh, and can't thank you enough for all the work you put into everything you've done so far, but even this presentation is uh, extremely impressive. So um, I'd like to ask the first question, sure. uh, if I may, Andrea, while other people are, are thinking um, about some questions. You um, highlighted, you know, technology as, you know, one of the really critical components of this, you know, state of the art um, facility. And so, um, although, when this is built and we are all enjoying it, it's post COVID, you know, were there any considerations from, uh, from a design standpoint or even with the technology to accommodate, you know, any issues that may be lingering or just may be part of the future of, of all of us enjoying a venue with a large gathering of people? Absolutely. It would be, it would not be prudent of us to not consider the environment that we're living in today. Although I hope, you know, the last pandemic was over a hundred years ago. I hope we don't see this yeah. for another hundred years, but it would be ridiculous for us not to consider that from happening again, from people developing the desire not to be super close to each other. And, um, and also there's the, the ability of people to think, well, I can enjoy a lot of things now from home. I can work from home. I can enjoy productions from home. We have to think about all of that, right, in the planning of a piece of infrastructure like this. Um, so it, yes, we have thought about that. Through digital broadcasting on different surfaces and in different spaces, you can space people out and still have events go on. So as I said, you can have up to 6,000 people in varying different spaces, up to six different spaces, or you can spread those people out and have one single event spread out in multiple amount of areas, allowing for social distancing. So there could be a presentation going in the main hall, allowing the seats to be adapted for six foot spacing minimum, mm -hmm. while uh, simulcasting the, the production or whatever it is that you're seeing, the lecture, the TEDx, on the surface of the amphitheater, for example, and having people sit outside, which again is enabled through the use of the canopy. It's still hospitable, it's still enjoyable, it protects against weather covering issues, um, and then you've got the 99 seat space, which is hugely adaptable, the lobby space, which could have broadcast ability. So you can really maximize a, a single event in many different areas, allowing for it to be spread out. Perfect. Good. Thank you. And then right along uh, with that on the technology side, Andrea, someone had a question. Have you had any interaction or conversation with Magic Leap, um, you know, to integrate any of their two new technologies into this uh, facility? With who? With Magic Leap? Magic Leap. Oh, with Magic Leap. Magic we have Leap, that, yeah. but it's a really great point. I'm going to put it down that we should. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for whoever brought that up. Yes. Well, we'll we will give uh, credit to uh, Rob Jager, um, our trustee member and uh, chair of our Boynton uh, Government Affairs Committee uh, for that. So, Rob, I'm, I'm calling you out today. Thanks. Great question. Bob, Andrea okay. likes it. Yeah, I'll be sure to get in touch with Rob and, and chat a little more about that. Um, another question here, 
um, talks about grants. Is there money coming in from, from grants? Are you actively applying for grants? For this Absolutely. type of project and how's that activity going? Absolutely. So DeVos Institute, in addition to putting together our strategic planning and our business modeling, they are the best in the world at capital campaigns and in raising money. And we have looked at over 500 different sources <clears throat> in, in, in terms of funding this project. Individuals that are, you know, philanthropists in this area that focus solely on arts and culture. So it's, it's not just saying, okay, you know, Joe, who does, you know, and is, philanth is a philanthropist, if he doesn't dedicate money to arts and culture, which at its core this still is, even though it has technology and, and a civic aspect to it, um, we want to be very conservative in our estimating. So we looked at just arts and culture um, philanthropists, we looked at institutions, we looked at corporations, we looked at uh, different government sources as well, um, and all of that research being very conservative, assuming Everyone we ask, 50% of those people would give and that, um, that they would give 50% of what we ask. So trying to be extremely conservative in our feasibility study, and that is what set our budget. So we had originally come up with a, a set of architectural schematics that once we priced it out with Moss and Suffolk, came back a little higher than that. And so for that reason, we scaled it back. We worked with the existing amphitheater to create that second space. We worked with MPCC to put some of that original program into an existing space to really tighten up the budget and match up along with the feasibility study. Great, thanks. Andrea, another question has to do with about um, uses by organizations and it's, do you envision uh, the facility to be used more by organizations outside of our area, either out of, out of um, town or out of state or more local? So it's a combination. So we have an advisory board specifically for this reason. In other venues across the country, this happens every time, it starts off with the, the core belief of trying to provide infrastructure for the local organizations, which is hugely important or else they can't thrive. Um, and then they get shut out through the higher rental business for something coming in from out of town. That is not what we're gonna be doing here. So we formed this, we started this whole project for that and we maintained um, this advisory board which has two voting seats on our fiscal board to ensure that the local stakeholders continue to have a place to perform and to thrive and to enhance their programming out of. Um, it would have been a shame to have done all of this. I'm born and bred from a local organization to have not carved out uh, time, space, and attention to those local stakeholders. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. And there's a question here about traffic and, and um, acknowledging that you, you did your study. Uh, but the question is, can both Federal Highway and Meisner Boulevard sustain that influx of traffic when this facility is being highly used or at its highest use? So yes, uh, the, the traffic study, the study that was done through John Donaldson, the traffic engineer who knows Boca very, very well, um, the study con con that was conducted showed that the traffic can be accommodated without the addition of additional infrastructure improvements um, to, a, to accommodate this center. Good. That's always important here, is uh, making sure we deal with traffic. Absolutely. Um, you had mentioned, I think, earlier in the presentation, Andrea, the, the Brown Theater. The Brown right? University Theater. Brown yeah. University Theater. So, I mean, is that, is that the, the one that is most like what this vision is? It's um, very, and, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, and are there others around in the country that, that are existing now that we could, you know, wrap our head around that would be kind of like that? I know this is unique, but, you know. Okay. Yeah, Similarly. there are about a handful of theaters that are like this. This is the new way of building theaters in the future, and it's a smart way of doing it because, again, you can't just build single-use, single-purpose because our world evolves every single day, and we need a venue that can adapt with it. Um, this is one example, the Brown University Theater. There's also the newly, um, the newly showcased Ron Perlman uh, Performing Arts Center at Ground Zero, which is a, an excellent example. It's a very cool design. It's a cube sitting on its corner and within the cube, it can have a million different things and different types of activity going on all at the same time. So that's another good example. Uh, there's the AT&T um, facility out of Dallas. Um, I'm happy to share a list of other venues you can look at, but like I said, uh, likely less than 10 in the country. This would certainly be the first one in the Southeast region of the United States. Awesome. In our own backyard. Great. Um, I would like to recognize, I know Deputy Mayor O'Rourke uh, is, uh, or was, had, had joined us. So 
um, Deputy Mayor, thank you for for being on this call. I think I think that you're the only elected that I that I happen to see on this on this call. I'm so um, watching it. Thank you very much for recognizing uh, that. that so. Thank you for for joining us. Um, so it looks like we've answered all the questions uh, so far that I see. Um, we are right on time. There's about five minutes left. Um, I want to just, and, and there may be a few more here. You've done your your presentation was so comprehensive uh, and so good that I mean you you, uh, you were answering any question probably that anybody had uh, about the about the um, the facility. But you know that as you know, Andrea and everybody on this call, the the Boca Chamber uses the words live, work, learn, and play uh, as part of our mantra. If you have our annual magazine in your office or whatever. Uh, you see that that constantly, and you know we believe um, that Boca Raton is the best place to live, work, learn, and play. And we have all of those uh, those assets: uh, economic development assets, educational assets, healthcare assets. And now this sort of really does sort of complete right the arts and cultural uh, innovative assets um, that again uh, brings a ton of jobs, infuses this uh, community. Uh, with tremendous commerce um, and economic impact. And so, uh, you know, again, your, your uh, three years of work uh, clearly are, 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 ind are indicative of how successful this, this project can be, hopefully will be, uh, down the road. And I know that um, I, for one, can't wait to, to participate and, and, and attend the many different kind of uses that, that you've described that, that we can do it. So you have fewer events there. Many chamber events could occur there. Exactly, exactly. That, that's what I'm thinking. We we got a lot of things going on here. I'm thinking maybe battle the bands. You know, Chastity's uh, probably thinking about that already, but uh, supporting our own nonprofit, Golden Bell, right? But so you did talk about there was that one piece, um, that one building that was also kind of multi-use. You said shared space. Yeah, let me highlight that. Maybe, maybe sort of office type stuff. Can you? go into a little bit more about what your vision is for that as well? Absolutely, let me see if I can get to that, that section here in a moment. Um, so this is that space right in here. So this, is, this could be rehearsal space. This could be, unfortunately the Flamingo House, um, I know had, had to leave their, their current space. This could be a place for shared working uh, space, for creative working space. There's office space here as well. This is highly flexible right now. Uh, we are at the inception of this project and there's still a lot of evolution that can happen through the planning stages, which as you saw in the timeline could be as much as two to three years. So there's a lot of adapt adaptability that could be proposed within the center. This is, this is our first wave of, at this. There's a lot of public and stakeholder engagement that still needs to happen. Once we get the green light, again, we've spent a half a million dollars on the endeavor so far. We don't really want to go too far forward in really fine tuning this until we've at least gotten the green light um, to proceed forward. Because without that, um, you can imagine the donors are, are pretty uh, hesitant to start putting out more money um, to continue the effort any further than where it is today. But yes, there is some, some there's a lot of possibilities here. Right here, you just see studio space, but that could be anything. Got it, good, very flexible. Yes. Well, um, Andrea, we are right on time um, with this. Again, that was an amazing uh, presentation. Just a ton of information, as I said, so, so much great uh, good news for us to hear uh, during our, 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 our COVID environment that, that we're living in. Uh, and this gives us something to look forward to. Um, you know, another um, phrase we use here at the Boca Chamber is moving business forward. Uh, and this, this project is absolutely moving business forward, as I mentioned, because of the economic impact, the jobs, um, supporting our local economy uh, is critical. So um, again, I'll remind everybody um, that, uh, that uh, most of our, our Zooms and, and content like this is on our YouTube channel. Please go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you missed something on this comprehensive presentation, you wanna go back and look, uh, you can hear Andrea give it uh, all over again. So um, we're getting a lot of thumbs up here in the chat, Andrea. We're getting a lot of great presentation. I didn't know much about it. This is great. Um, thank you, uh, all that good stuff. So there will be more to come, obviously. We're gonna have you back. Um, hopefully we can have you back in an in-person event, but we know we can at least do this as you continue to make uh, amazing progress uh, with the project. So 
Um, with that, I'll, again, thank you again for, for everything. I keep it up and to all our participants today, thank you uh, for joining us for this very special Zoom. Uh, everybody have a great rest of the day. Uh, stay safe and we'll see you very soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Troy.